Welcome to Big Blend Radio, where we celebrate variety and how it adds spice to quality of life. Welcome, everybody. Today, we get to welcome Dr. Tamara Walker to join us to talk about her memoir called, well, it's kind of a memoir. It's a little bit of a memoir and a storybook. It's uh, called Beyond the Shores, A History of African Americans Abroad. And this is a New York Times book review editor's choice. And I encourage you to go to her website. It is TamaraJWalker.com. That's the initial J. So welcome, Tamara. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I love that you've written this book because Beyond the Shores, I think a lot of times we think of, okay, uh, African-Americans coming here through slavery, but not getting out, right? Um, The first time I think I heard about it was learning about like the Tuskegee Airmen going over during World War II, going to Europe and going and getting accepted just as, hey, you're normal people. And they're going like, what do you mean? You know, This is not how we were treated in the States. Yet here they were fighting right in part of the military. And you you basically make this case that this was going on a little bit earlier, right? Yeah, so I start the story in the 1920s and it it's both a memoir and a narrative history that charts mm-hmm. a century of people on the move. And so I start the story in the 1920s, in part because that's the decade when my grandparents were born in Alabama, and they have Mm -hmm. a journey that takes them outside of the U.S. and eventually to Colorado, where I was born. But the other reason I start the story in the 1920s is because I mark that as the period when the modern history of African-American travel began with the entertainers that went to Paris in the 1920s. We tend to think of Josephine Baker when we think of that time period. But in choosing to focus on a woman named Florence Mills, the one in the orange section of the Mm -hmm. book cover, I wanted to show that this was a history that went beyond some of those bold face names. And in her time, she was quite famous and was often compared to Josephine Baker. But in the intervening years, she has become less known in part because she she died early. And Mm -hmm. I'll come back to that because that's an important part of the, the story that I tell in the book. But I wanted to spotlight this larger history of African-Americans going and sometimes returning home from abroad at the time staying in the countries that they had traveled to. And the reason I braid my own family experience into that is to show how much it touched more ordinary people beyond some of the the high flyers that we think of when we think of African-Americans abroad. And then yeah. the, the narrative chapters kind of go decade by decade over the course of the 20th century to talk about different points in time that presented a set of reasons for African-Americans to leave the United States. So you mentioned the Tuskegee Airmen, and often when there's this sort of larger um, mainstream history of African-Americans going abroad, it is focused on the World War II era and the Mm. European theater. And I wanted to acknowledge that, but also to, to cast a wider net and to tell a further reaching story. So for example, in the 1930s, I talk about a group of agronomists and crop scientists who went to the Soviet Union. And part of the reason they went to the Soviet Union was not necessarily by choice. These were people who had trained at Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. So speaking of Tuskegee, they trained at the (laughs) Tuskegee Institute and trained with George Washington Carver and had skills that would have been of tremendous service during the Depression era. They knew how to make a lot out of a little in terms of developing crops that could sustain people and feed them. And during the Great Depression, that would have been a tremendously valuable skill. But because of the nature of racism in the United States, these were people who were relegated to dishwashing in hotel kitchens and to serving as Pullman porters and railway cars. And so they were not working in the fields that they had trained in. And what happened in the 1930s was that the Soviet Union and its competition for global dominance with the United States saw African-Americans as a weapon, honestly, to use against the United States. And they saw them also as as comrades, people who had valuable skills that could be of use. Mm -hmm. And the people that I followed to Uzbekistan were responsible for helping to cultivate crops, including cotton. And the cotton that they introduced to Uzbekistan continues to be grown today. So they had a really powerful and long lasting impact on the region that they visited. but they were also, again, used as, as political weapons in this struggle for global wow. dominance between the Soviet Union and the United States. So there's a lot of stories in there. And even when I talk about Florence Mills, I talk about Paris, but I try to disrupt this sort of romantic view that people have of Paris in the 1920s. Mm-hmm. Certainly, it was a welcoming place. 
the nightclubs where they performed on stage were welcoming to African Americans in ways that the Cotton Club here in New York City, where I live, was not. People would perform on the stages at the Cotton Club, but not be able to so much as have a glass of water at a table there. Whereas in Paris, they were welcomed not only as performers, but also as patrons. Mm -hmm. That being said, Paris also had its own complicated history of racism, colonialism, and slavery, and a diverse population of African descent that was living in Paris in the 1920s that was being mistreated and being excluded, being denied full citizenship. And so part of the story I tell in the pages of the book when I talk about Paris and other parts of the world is to talk about the complicated racial histories that the African-Americans who I profile encountered when they arrived at their destinations. And that applies yeah. to Paris and to the other places as well. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, when you think about that, too, because you talk about her death, you know, Florence Mills. Um, also, when you think about the medical world, too, I mean, how in this country has been, especially for women, oh, boy, <laughs> it, has, it has not been easy. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're of color, it's like, oh, no, sorry, you know, you can have a park, but we're not going to give you trees. We're not going to give you full medical benefits. But oh, you're free now. And now we question, oh, well, hey, you know, why are you having these issues over here? Well, maybe you got left out and other countries have done it, you know, and I think mm -hmm. even England's a little guilty of some of it too, you know, it's like, I'm not going to, I'm going to get in trouble, whatever I say, it's going to get in trouble. But every, I don't think, I don't, I don't know what society does, why, but it is everywhere. I mean, living in South Africa, we watched that and it was against not just, you know, you know, we got kicked out of places as women, you know, and, and the time frame. I was a little kid, my mom went into a restaurant and they kicked her out because it was men only. And it wasn't, you know, so there was a lot of different, ah, I love that you're writing about this because it's just so, it's complicated and complex. And there's a lot of stories that never get told and we just have this one thing. And like you're saying, this romantic ideas in our head, it's it's not, even Josephine Baker, she didn't have a glorious, easy life. She didn't, you know, um, people going overseas. I was, we just did a show on um, musicians of Georgia and we did one at the, with the, our friend, Joey Stuckey. And we did one also in the African-American music experience of Georgia. And there was a lady who is an incredible violinist and she, and I didn't know this. And I'm like, why isn't nobody talking? I found this woman. I'm like listening to her music going, no, I've never, no, this is, she should be up there with the Josephine Bakers, right? And you know what? She moved to France and said, that's it, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. And she died there. So I think there were, like, that was that story. And I'm like, but here's her tiny Wikipedia page. But she did a lot. And a lot of people profited off of the musicians that traveled too, a lot of people profited off of these people that were going, "Hey, I want to move out. I want to get away from this." So, does when you started following her story and getting into all these different stories, did you kind of go into a rabbit hole? Like, did this kind of consume you? Does absolutely. I mean, I had to make a lot of tough choices in terms of who I decided to focus on because each chapter, each narrative chapter of the book focuses on a particular person or a pair of people and a place or a pair of places. And so there were a lot of people I, I wanted to talk about and who I'll make reference to here and there in different chapters. Um, and what it told me was that I was really just scratching the surface of this long history of African-Americans on the move. And I wanted to go back to what you had pointed out about Florence Mills, the fact of the, the, the tragedy that cut her life short. She ends up dying um, back in the U.S. of appendicitis. And it's really tragic and it speaks to the unequal medical treatment and attention that African-Americans got in the 1930s and it was an important thing to incorporate into the book the the fact of her death and her life being cut short because it meant that the book was also about tragedy that alongside what people perceive to be the romance and the adventure of travel is also this really mm -hmm. profoundly sad story about african americans needing to leave the united states to experience their full humanity and to experience some degree of, of belonging but many of the people that I talk about and I start every narrative chapter or discuss in every narrative chapter, the dilemma that a lot of these people encountered when it came to deciding to leave the United States. Not everyone was easily convinced to leave or 
thirsting to leave. Mm -hmm. Some people really needed to be convinced to take leave of their home country, the places that they were born and that their grandparents and ancestors had built and that they had a claim to, right? And they had a belief that they belonged in and they had families and they had friends and communities that they were hesitant to leave. And so I wanted to just make that clear in the, the book that this is not just a story about people picking up and pursuing adventure. I mean, that's there, but there's also something much more profound and nuanced as well. Yeah, I think that is like that in travel. You know, I know that for, you know, and you've traveled too, right? You you grew up around the world and you is that part of your background. So you understand that like, you know, oh, you're my best friend and sorry, I'm leaving and I won't see you for probably ever again. <laughs> you know, that feeling. It's hard. I grew up that way. I mean, I went to 16 schools. It is not easy to yeah. keep moving and picking up. You You get strong. And you do get skills from it. So I'm not knocking it, but it is not um, easy when you think about it. And I think from an adult, it's even harder. Don't you think kids are kind of resilient, but as an adult, do you think it's harder for people to pick up and move like that? I think it depends, you know, and what I tried to do in the book was kind of spotlight different perspectives, people at different life stages. So I have a chapter about a young woman named Philippa Schuyler who is a piano player or was a piano player and who from a very young age was traveling um, with her parents by herself. And she was around 13 years old when she went to, to Mexico for the first time. And she was someone who had really lived a kind of isolated girlhood. Her parents um, sent her to school, but she was really precocious in her talents and her parents really wanted to cultivate her talents, piano playing, poetry recitation, composition, all these other things, and hold her up as an example for other young girls and young African-American girls, especially to follow. So it meant that she was kind of lonely and isolated. And so for her to be able to travel to Mexico and she had this really experience, this really interesting experience that she later wrote about in an article um, for a young girl's interest magazine, that was, was really fun for her to be able to kind of feel like a teenager mm -hmm. and to just hang out with a peer group that she didn't grow up with and that wasn't shaped by the same racial system that she had grown up in mm. the U.S. with. And so it, the article that she ends up writing is really a neat window onto what traveling as a young person is like. It was a short-lived thing. It wasn't in a life of an expatriate necessarily because she was more itinerant. She traveled a lot for piano recitations around the world in part because she wasn't welcomed on US stages um, despite her mm. prodigious talents. And so she, mm. in order to make a living was traveling to all these different parts of the world but it made her a real global citizen in every sense of the word. She just had such a deep knowledge of different histories and cultures and religious practices and wrote about it, developed friendships with people all over the place, spoke multiple languages. She really did embody a kind of global citizenship that, again, was was not necessarily her choice, but was something that she really made the, the most of. And so I just admired that, especially for someone her age, right? And I do think that, to your point about how different travel is for, for kids, is that they they don't always know any different. And so for her, especially, she was someone who really knew a life of itinerancy and solitude. And that, I think, really equipped her to travel in ways that made her inclined to build new friendships and communities, but also to be OK by herself and to rely on herself and to get herself out of situations because she ran into a couple um, really challenging situations and she got by on her her wits. And some of that is also just the the bravery of youth and mm. the fact that her, her brain was a sponge and she was able to pick up languages early on. And, you know, that's, that's cool. always the best time to learn a foreign language. So she was really interesting in that sense. Yeah, you have, I think when you travel, you start to realize you're so not alone in the world of a situation. You know, you, it, it, it really broadens your heart and your soul and your mind. It just, it's, there's a freedom to it. And yes, you have bumps and there's always a detour. You're not traveling if there's no detours. Like, come on, there's always a detour. For you as, as an individual and, and raised in different countries, uh, how, how do you feel about travel and, and the importance of it for humans? I mean, I think in the best possible 
version of travel, it is expansive and it does allow people to make connections with different communities and cultures and, and ways of life. I think often though, the way, especially with modern travel, the way people tend to approach modern travel, it doesn't always allow for it. Um, and instead of creating connection, it creates um, boundaries and limitations. Mm -hmm. There are certain types of travel that, that just allow for that. I think um, mm. one of the things I talk about um, in the work that I do with my nonprofit is the the oh, challenge so that comes from volunteerism. And yeah, I can talk more about this nonprofit that it's called the Wandering Scholar. And it its mission is to make international education opportunities accessible to high school students from low income backgrounds. And one of the reasons that we structure our program in the, with students doing documentation projects in their host country is in part as a response to the kind of volunteerism industry, which is a deeply entrenched system of, of youth travel that's focused on, on service, on building playgrounds, on volunteering in orphanages, on providing services that members of the community are perfectly capable of providing themselves, but often volunteerism organizations don't pay attention to the actual needs of the community that they mm -hmm. descend upon or don't pay attention to the capacities that the members of that community already have. Many people with building skills, engineering degrees, backgrounds that are actually better suited to building playgrounds and structures than high school students actually have. And there's all kinds of challenges that come into play when it comes to working and volunteering in orphanages where there can be a lot of harm done to the children in those orphanages um, and a lot of long lasting trauma left by it. And so there there are some ways in which travel um, can can close us off to to new forms of knowledge and connection to local communities and be more about serving our own resume building needs and our own well, immersive. desires. It, 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 immersive. I mean, there's students that stay with other student families and things like that, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they go to school together. Is, is that something positive you'd say? I think that's wonderful. Yeah. And I've had so many experiences like that when I was in high school, when I was in college, I was able mm -hmm. to stay with host families and to immerse myself in the life of the host family for anywhere from a week to a whole semester. And there's lots of programs for, for adults to do similar mm -hmm. kinds of homestays um, that are out there that I think allow people to immerse themselves in the, the culture of the, the country that they're, they're visiting and to mm -hmm. get a sense of what life is like for people just on a, a ordinary kind of quotidian basis. What's it like to, to commute to work in a certain kind of city at a yeah, certain time go to of school. day? And I love this about, you know, the low income side too, because there's so many just, you know, opportunities get closed off all the time and, and education has really had a hard time. Um, education, the arts, I mean, you know, like that, yeah. there's a giant list over the last 10, 15 years of yeah. things that have just been cut off and yet education, I, I mean, where we aren't anything without it. And, yeah. you know, and experience has to be part of it. I know you're a professor, you know, and, and everything too. So you understand, okay, there's the book side and the study and, and the, you know, the application part, but there's mm -hmm. also the immersion and the experience that has to go with it. I don't believe yeah. education can just be book smarts. I just don't personally. I think you have to have some kind of experience, where even if it's just going to the museum or something, you've got to go mm -hmm. out and have that immersion, that aha, that connection beyond the page, wouldn't you say, as, mm -hmm. as an educator? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not knocking books, though. You know that. Because <laughs> <laughs> books can transcend and take us anywhere. And I think that's the first yeah. tool that we all have as individuals. Um, and the first important thing is to have literacy in, in education, right? And, and, you know, be able to read. But a book can transport us anywhere. And I think a lot of young folks can read your book and understand that you can move forward, right? With these stories from the people that you wrote about, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I braid 
through the book, my own experience of, of immersive travel, of experiential learning and how that put me on the path to becoming a professor. I had the, the fortune and privilege of going to a private school that really believed in experiential education. So each mm -hmm. year over spring break, they would have these immersive programs that were both local and international. You could do projects in local theaters, or you could go to Mexico like I did in France, like I did in high school, where I was able to stay with host families and take language classes and go to museums awesome. and have these, these experiences that went beyond what we were reading in our textbooks and what we were learning day to day. And I wrote about those things in the book in terms of how they kind of responded to a need that I had to experience something outside of the, the really kind of con constrained world that I, I lived in as a scholarship student commuting across town from a low income neighborhood to this wealthy community filled with fancy schools and wealthy kids attending them who had all these really interesting travel experiences. And so my own interest in travel came from, from being in that environment and mm -hmm. recognizing how much I had missed out on and how much I was still missing out on because even though I was on scholarship at the school, I wasn't necessarily getting scholarship support until I advocated for myself to go on these oh. um, international programs. And so that was also part of the reason that I ended up founding The Wandering Scholar is because I knew just how important those experiences were to the high school experience, to the college experience, and how foundational they are to, to particular career paths. In my case, having went to high school, having gone to high school in Mexico, um, having mm. gone during college to having studied abroad in Argentina in college. Um, those were two things that together made me decide that I wanted to major in Spanish in college and that I wanted to get a PhD in Latin American history. Mm. And then when I was in graduate school, I got a Fulbright to go to Peru and happened to be at a gathering of fellow Fulbright fellows who had gotten together in the Andes, people who had been sent to the Andes for their research. So Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, various other places. And we had convened in this hotel ballroom in Lima, where I noticed that I was the only black person in the room. And I happened to be seated next to a representative from the Fulbright organization and asked what was going on and why there was such a, a lack of diversity in the, the recipients of these fellowships. And that conversation really planted the seeds for the Wandering Scholar, because one of the things that she said to me was that there, there wasn't enough of a pipeline um, of students to apply oh. for these sorts of international fellowships. And I understood that I had been part of a pipeline, that I had gone to Mexico, gone to Argentina had, as a result of that. And my major got fluent in Spanish and had done independent research because of a fellowship program I was a part of as an undergraduate. And so I, on paper, was exactly the sort of person Mm. that would get a Fulbright. But I understood that I had been tremendously lucky in that sense and had been on on a particular path. And so I wanted to create a path. My partner in The Wandering Scholar, Shannon Keating, and I both recognized the need for a pipeline and that we could play a key role in, in creating it, especially for high school students, to then get them cool. thinking about what they'll do in college and then get them yeah. thinking about what kind of careers they want that connect them to the world. That's awesome because it is, it's true going out there. And I mean, we lived in Mexico for a while and I had to learn Spanish like immediately. I can't mm -hmm. speak anything now, but I was, like, it was like going from, you know, different, I, it's weird because all the languages actually connect. And so I was like, wake up in the morning, where am I? What language? <laughs> what? You know, and I'll be like, because they, they uh, like they say muy bueno right in, in Afrikaans in South Africa, it's bueno, like it's okay. It's, you know, the moy is uh, it, they say by a moy over there it's like very nice so it's like things mm -hmm. like that would be so similar and it's mm -hmm. like I took German and Afrikaans at the same time that couldn't happen mm -hmm. like it was, it was like <laughs> hard but but being immersed in the cultures it's it just when you travel you go beyond what the news is telling you you can you it it's it becomes personal you know, so like, I think we get desensitized by numbers on how many people got shot today, what's going on in wars, you get desensitized because you just see numbers all the time. 
And I don't know if video games make it desensitized. I don't know what it is, but there's a, but if you've been to a place and you know people from that place and say there's an earthquake or something, I'm being on the negative. I don't want to mean to be negative. There's also a lot of positive, cool stuff going on, right? But when you see this, you have a feeling and a different understanding, I think, than just the typical numbers. That doesn't mean we don't care with the numbers, but we are becoming desensitized with all these things happening around the world. But when you've gone places, there's this extra connection, right? Like everybody that's been to Maui cared about what happened about the wildfires. Of course, we all care about the wildfires. But having gone there, I think that's going to be a little bit more personal, right? Yet the world is small, but big at the same time. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that we try to do when we work with wandering scholars is to instill in them, one, a sense of media literacy. So we have them reading content produced by people living in their host country, reading oh, awesome. newspapers and websites and just going through different sources of information before they even set foot on a plane so that they have some understanding of the history and culture mm. and in the context of the place that they're going so they can be informed once they once they arrive and they'll have a sense of those numbers and a sense of okay why why are things the way they are what's going on with this migrant crisis um what do I need to understand about different parts of the world in order to understand why mm -hmm. migrants from various parts of the world are making their way to Europe? And why is Europe either receptive to their presence or not mm -hmm. receptive to their presence? How do I understand that so that I'm not so, so shocked when I see people sleeping on the streets or or see I'm like uh, which country are you talking about now you know that's, you know yeah I'm, yeah it can I'm, be multiple places yeah. it is it is but you bring up the migrant side of it and you know if you look at the history of mankind we've always been on the move you know even mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. number of our Native American cultures have moved south from you know from you know Canada and then a lot came from you know South America Latin America up here so there's a lot of movement in and also in Africa a lot of the tribes moved around a lot Yet, you know, it's, it's, um, we are nomadic people from the beginning, earlier times, I would say, depending on where you, you know, where we are, like, in Iceland and stuff, I don't know what they were doing, but I could say they were on boats getting like fish, I don't know. But you know what I mean? There's just you no know, being nomadic is, I think, we always have to move out of uh, survival. And, you know, also the grass is greener. It's not always 100% true, right? It's never 100% green on the other side, but there's going to be something new to learn and go through and other obstacles. But your book, you know, Beyond the Shores brings that full circle to, we've been doing this for quite a while and, you know, people move and it just was, I, I think that's amazing because it's just kind of not put together as a forceful like here's a book like here like the, it, it, and in force you don't hear like a collection of stories like this very often it should be a series I mean when you started you know what was the first I mean you're talking about your grandparents and in your history but I mean did you just keep stumbling on these stories or were you rabbit holing on YouTube what was going on that you started getting all these stories and going okay now I'm gonna have to write this book and then next thing you know now I might have a Netflix series I don't know I'm just saying <laughs> yeah, well, from from your lips to God's ears on that front. <laughs> um, yeah, but, I think it'd be good on yeah. PBS. It would be good on PBS. I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I I wrote a lot of the chapters with a sense of of storytelling in mind because one, I wrote it during the pandemic when I was not able to travel, and I wanted my own kind of armchair experience of travel, yeah. and then I knew that there would be readers out there who might not be able to to travel to the various parts of the world I cover in the book. And certainly they can't travel back in time. So I wanted people to have this armchair experience of travel and feel transported by the stories that I told. And then I had to make choices in order to give people a real sense of the the reach of this this story, that it wasn't just about going to Paris in the 1920s, that there for every corner of the world you can think of there were African Americans going there. And in fact, one of the people that kind of recurs at different points throughout the book is Langston Hughes, who wrote a travel autobiography called I Wander as I Wander. And I drew a lot of inspiration and insight. 
from that book. And one of the things he says is that in his book, he he chronicles this journey around the world. And he's like, you know, I've, I've been around the world and I've seen at least one Negro everywhere, which really kind of underscores how far reaching yeah. this story is. And so I wanted to capture that. I wanted to capture the world beyond Paris. That's why I talk but about only the one, Soviet Union. Like one, you know what I mean? That's like a, it's interesting. It's like, okay, great. But then it's not so great because there's only like one, right? At least one. Well, he said at least one. He said at least, at least one. one. So then he but would still, always be, yeah. he would, well, and that was what was interesting because Langston Hughes actually ran into the the agronomist that I followed to Uzbekistan because they all okay. happened to be in Moscow at the same time. And Langston Hughes was there with a the film crew that featured, um, it consisted of some actors, some writers, and they were all there, this group of African-Americans um, who were hoping to film a, a movie in, in Moscow. It didn't end up happening, but that's what took them there. And then the crop scientists that I follow were passing through there on their way to Uzbekistan. And there were other people, black people involved in the communist movement who were in Moscow. So Moscow happened to be a place where there had been a lot of African-Americans passing through. And there were some wow. kind of hotels and restaurants where they would all happen to run into each other. And that's true of so many places, right? That there were, mm. and you know, some of the numbers vary. And there are some places that were more popular at particular times mm -hmm. than others, places that were centers of gravity for lots of reasons. I just actually got um, back from Seattle where I saw an exhibition at the National Nordic Museum there on African-Americans in the Nordic countries in the 20th century. Okay, so then in... you got, you could cover me now. That's good. <laughs> I didn't want to leave. Yeah, they out. were in Iceland. They were in yeah, okay. Denmark. They were in Sweden. They, they were all mm -hmm. over and their presence there fueled other people's presence, right? Where they would be inspired to know that this was a place where people could make lives could for go. themselves and follow in their footsteps, right? So there's also that story, the story of people who inspire other people, yeah. exactly. And so I wanted did you to see the, that in the book. Did you see the giant troll outside the museum? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we happened to get a tour from, from the curator who was telling us about how that came together and that it couldn't be um constructed in Seattle so it was constructed on an island and then transported in in parts to its its current home that's cool we did we did a story on that one of our travel writer Linda Kassam did this and she she went and did the trolls and we saw the trolls in Kentucky yeah in a, oh, in a, wow. in a forest out there so we're like yeah. it's the same troll guy I mean, it's huh. like I'm following <laughs> trolls across the country why not but, you know, but those are those things too that you know, we are all connected. And I think books do that. You know, yeah. I think you're really right about that armchair travel too, because not everyone can get any everywhere. You know, you, you can maybe do one country, some people just won't, maybe it's even a physicality. Financial is always the thing, right? And some people just don't want to get on a plane. I don't blame them. <laughs> yeah. And there's, other, there's this other angle. And it's something that I've been increasingly thinking about. And you had mentioned Maui, you know, there are a lot of native Hawaiians who do not want tourists to come, right? And then we think about yes. the impact of over tourism on places like mm. Venice and how much local yes. populations really suffer from their homes becoming really popular. And often there are people there who recognize just how important tourism is to their local economy and to their livelihood, but who are almost quite literally drowning under the weight of it. And yes. asking people to stay away either for the short term or for the long haul. And so what does it mean for people who care about these places to, to hear that? And what, is it, what does it ask of us? Because it might ask well, us to stay home. We have to grow up as travelers, honestly, and stop being so... I just did a podcast right before you about this. Um, and we were talking about, well, transformational travel and regenerative mm -hmm. travel are the two kind of big things happening now in yeah. tourism, which is fantastic because it means you're giving back and you're becoming part of it. So, so for so long tourism, and that is pretty much who we are is tourism, but mm -hmm. we're about responsible and sustainable, which means you don't go in to take, mm -hmm. you know, you, you need a shared experience in the, in the community. You've got a community, you've got your, your attraction. Like we do a lot of parks and public lands, Mm -hmm. to save those places and the historic sites um you know we travel full time 100 percent on the road doing that and 
it is about saving these spaces because eventually we, we're not going to be able to breathe if we don't. Right. Yeah. And yeah. the fact is there's things like Airbnb coming in that's taking on entire communities and the tourism is not working even for the traveler because you aren't getting anyone right. to clean the toilets because you price them out of the area and they have to drive in what, two, three hours to clean the toilets of an Airbnb. That's what's happening across the country and around the world with these Airbnb things where you have a perfectly regular beaver cleaver kind of little neighborhood and people are buying up homes and making them Airbnbs. And so now- Which means that people from that place don't actually live And in the, the money goes up. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's another form of gentrification in a weird way, right? It's like you're changing the dynamic oh, of the community. Yeah. And so- you're taking it it's a big mess and the what you're doing is a form of travel and tourism as we travel the country we pet sit so i'm doing right now i'm in appalachia country looking out at the forest and going this is super cool i'm hanging out with the sick animals actually right now and taking care of them but i'm not taking away i'm putting back in because i go to the grocery store and a restaurant and stuff like that so i'm putting into the community it's a different form of travel and tourism I'm not saying don't support hotels and bed and breakfast try the mom and pops so it these experiences have to change and if it's immersive and you know if you go to another country you know you're putting money into them you're even putting money into the country you're leaving to get and we got to get our hair done before we travel right we got to <laughs> we're going to get a new suitcase so we're still putting it in so mm -hmm. it just is mm -hmm. about sustainable methods and the experiences we're seeking so it's not mm -hmm. take it should be we shouldn't be a separate community from the community we're visiting we should somehow yeah. connect is my point and a long way around and we that. absolutely and we shouldn't think of the the inhabitants of that community purely in terms of the services they provide us right and in terms of the kind of community service that so much mm -hmm. of volunteerism hinges upon right which presumes that people are in need of handouts and decisions mm -hmm. or assistance based on our decisions about what they need and what's good for them rather than their own sense of what mm. they need and what's good for them. And so I think that's also just an important layer to travel, right? That the inhabitants of the the communities that we visit are, are thinking layered, nuanced people, right? Not just people who are there to, to serve pencils. us or serve our egos, right? We don't all need yeah. pencils. Like mm -hmm. if we gave pencils, we all feel good about ourselves. Is that what you're talking mm -hmm. about? Yep. I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying. Yeah. 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 And I, you know, and that applies to lots of different scenarios and lots of, of places. And my partner and I, we have this concept of what we call intentional travel, which is traveling mm -hmm. with a meaningful purpose, with an eye towards sustainability mm -hmm. and with a sense, a real sense of our impact on the places that we visit. And it, it really boils down to traveling with an awareness that our our values don't go on pause when we travel and they instead represent our values. So we really mm -hmm. have to be intentional when we travel so that what we communicate about our values is, is consistent with those values. Because sometimes people like to think of themselves as as nuanced and thoughtful and, and critical and yet they participate in activities that people in those local communities think of as problematic and, and threatening to their way of life. And yet we want to, but by virtue of participating in certain kinds of, of travel, we're communicating something entirely different. And so how do we make sure that what we're communicating is consistent with what we, what we proclaim to value? And so that's the idea behind intentional travel, which means that there's no easy answers and that things kind of depend mm -hmm. on where we're going, when we're going, who we're going with and who we're interacting with when we're there. But it's the kind of thinking that is so beautiful about travel right travel makes us Ooh, think and think you in gave those me ways, a really right? good idea for a show to do we'll have to talk after but i seriously okay. but i feel this what you're doing is kind of like you know how we put things in a time capsule in the community town square kind of thing we bury in like mm -hmm. hey maybe the aliens will get it later or a hundred years yeah. from now they're going <laughs> to open it up and go what's a cassette tape or an a track yeah, yeah. or whatever or vinyl yeah. you know so but that's kind of the same thing when we go somewhere that intentional 
because we want something that represents who we are. Mm -hmm. Who are we of that time frame of this now? Yep. I know there's a time frame mm -hmm. with it, mm -hmm. but besides that, if you want to represent who you are, what are you showing? Uh, yeah, is this my latest that. dress or yeah. this is, you know, so when yeah. you travel, what are you thinking of? Yeah. And what are you reflecting of what you've read, what you've thought about, what you've consumed? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and it's okay to not speak the language well, because that's how you 100%. make friends. They love it if you're yeah. just trying and they trying. will laugh mm -hmm. at you and you should definitely laugh at yourself because it is funny. Yes. It's the best yeah. thing about travel. <laughs> you know, I love this. I love what you're doing. And I hope you come back on our show. We, we got to talk more, but really beyond the shores, bow down, man. I love it. And you did go to Kenya with it. See, Kenya. Oh, yeah. Kenya is the motherland. I'm telling you, everyone, once you go to Kenya, you it's never going to leave you. Once that dirt gets under your nails, you're going to go back. Oh. I'm telling you, it's it's a thing. Well, thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's it a real pleasure. I want everyone to know your website again. Tamara J. Walker. Tamara. See, I went Tamara. See, I did it. I uh, told you, give everyone a new language. Uh, TamaraJWalker.com, go get the book there. And then is there a website that people should go to for your nonprofit? The, the nonprofit, Scholar. it's called the, the Wandering Scholar, and you can reach it at thewanderingscholar.org. And that tells people about our, our programming, our student-focused programming. But we also, as another component of our mission, are invested in producing multimedia content that embodies our vision of engaged, globally competent citizenship. So you can learn more about our intentional travel initiative. We've also got a sub-staff that tells people about what's going on at the Wandering Scholar headquarters and also that functions as a kind of online travel magazine. So you can send people cool. to thewanderingscholar.org and they can find all that. Now, are you going to write part two, Beyond the Shores? Come on. I'm, I'm kicking around an idea. Yeah, yeah, that is is in keeping with the the spirit of, of the book. So here's I hoping. think it's an, it's an, I just think PBS and you need to talk like soon. Oh gosh, yeah. I'm just saying, yeah, don't you think? PBS. All yeah. right, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right. I love it. Thanks All so right. much for joining us, Tamara. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening to Big Blend Radio. Keep up with our shows at BigBlendRadio.com.